So we're here today to talk about the 40 games you must play. And I want to make it real clear. These are not the best 40 games. Basically, it's a bunch of warnings so that all you nerds don't come up and argue with us. <laughs> More importantly, these are not the most important 40 games. These aren't even 40 games. Try and count them. It's not going to be 40. <laughs> But think of it this way, like, there are games like Kalis or King's Quest that are really important to gaming, but they're not actually that fun in a modern context. Kalis really, is fun. Kalis isn't that fun. King's Quest is not fun. We like Kalis. Most people do not actually like Kalis. I don't know what's wrong with them. But also there are better worker placement games. Maybe. Just because something was first in a genre, just because it's the most popular of something, just because it changed the industry in some way, we don't care. We're talking about games that you should play for some reason. These are also not, and I want to be very clear about this, our favorite 40 games. There's a lot of, you know, it seems like most people, at least the people I see in the comment section on the internet, can't sort of separate what they like from what is good. So they'll just, if you don't like something, they'll say it sucks, right? Or if they do like something, they'll say it's awesome, even if it clearly sucks, right? I'm the kind of person where I can say, I love this, it's garbage, and also, this is amazing, I hate it. So while I love Aerobiz, which is a Super Nintendo game where you literally call board meetings and run an airline, you're the CEO. Don't that play is the Aerobiz game. for more than like a couple minutes just to see that it exists. I'm not going to be that internet shouty man who tells you to play my favorite game. We're also not talking about any new or relatively recent games. All right, when a game is new, it hasn't really stood the test of time yet. We don't know how important or awesome or amazing it is. We can sort of guess, be like, oh, this game's really hot right now. Yeah. But the thing is, sometimes things get really hot and go away. Sometimes things are not so hot, but then five years later, they're still hanging around and everyone's still playing them, right? And those are the games that are legit, the games that... Year after year, they're still being played, they're still being talked about, they're still relevant. Some games are super crazy popular, and then you forget about them entirely. That <laughs> game is gone to history. And also, this list is in a random order. I don't care who wins in a fight between Superman and Super Mario Brothers 3. Right. It takes a lot of effort to try to put them in a meaningful order, and we don't have effort here. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I just want to head you off. We're not going to tell you you need to play StarCraft. I figure you'll figure that one out on your own. Do not come up to us after the panel and say, hey, you forgot X. Yes, we can only pick 40. There's more than 40 games on Earth. <laughs> And more, even more importantly than that, we don't care if we missed anything. We literally don't. We picked 40 because we thought, based on our expertise, our professional experience, our personal experience, these would be the games that if you play them all, it might help you in some way. Be a better gamer, be a better person, enjoy games more, maybe enjoy games less. TLDR, if you come up to us after this panel and say, hey, what about game X? I'm going to say, did you not listen to me at the beginning of the panel, you nerd boy? Pay attention. And if you've seen us do this talk before, we've usually done it as the 40 tabletop games you must play. That's a lot easier panel to write than games. I had to consider things like football in putting this panel together. TLDR, the truth is, this is a really easy panel to put together. It takes like 10 minutes, and we got a free badge to MAGFest. So <laughs> you got to mix it up a little bit, though. Every, you know, you go to 10 different conventions, 10 different free badges. You can't do the same exact list every time. <laughs> So without further ado, we had to have one more stipulation because a lot of the games we want you to play, personally, are games that you can't play. I mean, you can play Tribes 2. There's like a patch you can put on there and like... Download an EXE file from some guy right. on the internet. Right, but the point is back in the day when Tribes 2 came out, I took the CD-ROM home, put it in my computer, installed it, created an account, logged in, and I joined a ser I clicked on the first server and it was 35 on 35 and everyone was playing. <laughs> Right? You will never experience that in your life. And that sucks. So we're leaving, basically we assume the game will only be on this list if the average MAGFest attendee could, with minimum effort, make the game work. Right. You have to be a computer expert and have 70 friends to recreate the Tribes 2 experience. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to trust that EXE file on the internet, which... You eh. might want to run that in a little sandbox or a VM or whatever. <laughs> so... If you play even a fraction of these games, someone out there might have already played all these games. I highly doubt it. Yeah, these people. <laughs> someone out, up Set out there. there. Yeah, someone not up, up there. Yeah. We're up here, you're down there. But the point of this is that a lot of people will start playing like the game they're into. Like, I only play trick-taking games, or I only play Overwatch. I only play Junkrat in Overwatch. But if you play a lot of games, a lot of different kinds of games, even games you don't think you'll like, even games you don't like, you'll become a better gamer. You'll get better at all games. 
And also, you'll have more fun at a con like MAGFest because, yeah, you could sit in tabletop and play only tabletop games. Just play Scythe over and over and over and over again the entire con. But there's an arcade there, too. There's more than one kind of game. We're going to start with a game called Wizard. Wizard. Wizard is a trick-taking game, right, so like old people in Michigan play. Right, so who's played a trick-taking game like Hearts, or Euchre, or Spades, or Foppin? <laughs> or, right? So Wizard, this is the trick-taking game that's sort of reigniting, reignited trick-taking among our friends. Right? And it's really awesome because it now involves not only the trick-taking, and not only awesome bidding mechanics, but this awesome artwork on this particular deck of cards. Yep, this is basically a reimagining of an old traditional trick-taking game called Oh Hell with amazing wizard art. Right, so, do you have the NARS up there? I don't have the NARS up there. Uh, but anyway, so you might wonder why do the wizards have Zs on them because it's a German game, so it's not wizard. It's, it's a Zauberer. It's a Zauberer. And they're Zauber crafting. Right, and the, the jesters are not J for Joker, they're uh, N for NAR. That's not confusing, it's really confusing. But. <laughs> If you've never played a trick-taking game, you don't want to find some weirdo and play Euchre with them. Play a game like this. This is a game you can trick a bunch of people who are suspicious of non-German uh, Euro games into playing a card game. Also, there's a card that looks exactly like our friend Scott Johnson. Who I just saw right before I came here. <laughs> Dance Dance Revolution. So when I saw this game for the first time, I said, that is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. I will not do that. And I stood next to Scott and said, yes, that is stupid. We will never do this thing. Look at those fools. And then we did that thing as long as we could. I've been playing DDR since third mix, and I'm not stopping. I love this game. Mm. There's a lot of rhythm games out there. The thing that makes DDR unique is that it's sort of the best balance between being a game and getting you to move in a way that almost looks like dancing. There is the new Dance Rush, which I have not played and was very disappointed I did not see it. They at can't all play it easily. I, d I wanted to see it at MAGFest. I didn't see it there. I really wanted it. This is real easy to play because you're at MAGFest. Arcades don't exist anymore except in this space. You can also find these pads and play this game. But a lot of rhythm games these days tend to be phone games. They tend to be like tapping things on a like Yeah, a the screen. ones that you push buttons or the ones, you know, a pair of pair you wave your hands, I guess that's okay. Right? That's Pump, close. Pump has the weird five arrows, which I don't like, but it has the K-pop music, <laughs> which I do like. So I don't know how that one goes, but... Yeah, but guess, DDR is still where it's at after all these years, and it's actually slightly increased in accessibility, not only because of MAGFest, not only because you can play it at home in various ways, but if you were in the arcade, you saw the white DDR machine, right? The, the big, the one that was the hardest to play because people were ganging up on it. That is like the most modern, newest DDR machine, and it was actually like distributed to the whole world, not just to Japan, like a lot of them were. So actually the most recent DDR world champion is from the US. That was someone who was able to get at one of those machines and actually make an account, get it hooked up online, and do all the scoring and stuff <laughs> like that. So DDR is accessible now. Yep, but that's it. It is the best balance between being a game where someone can win and be good at it and being a fun dancing game. So we gotta talk about at least one German board game. I think Tigris and Euphrates is the one to play. If you want to play a serious, for real, the decisions you make determine who wins game, this is it. Right, we've been playing this game since like 2001 or two, right, when it was taught to us by someone at the American publisher. Uh, and of all the games we've been playing since then, we played so many games, right? We played Settlers a shit ton. We played Carcassonne. We, we played, played Puerto Rico every day for an entire summer. Right. We played all these games so much, but eventually with all of those games, we said, ah, I know exactly how this game works, and we stopped playing it, right? We sort of saw through the Matrix, right? And there wasn't really much reason to play those games. We moved on to new games. With t &E, we cannot see through the entire Matrix, even still after 20 whatever freaking years it is. I don't know. Right. This game is just a very good competition among four players. Infinite replay value. And there's a new version, which just came out like this year, called uh, Yellow and Yangtze, which is almost the same game, crook slightly so, enough to be a different game, but like 90% of the rules are the same, but it's a hex map instead of a square map. <laughs> so play both of those, but this one more so. Super Mario 3. A lot of Mario games have come out over the years. Uh, there's a lot of debate over which one's the best one. I'm pretty sure it's this one. Maybe Super Mario World. Like it's pretty, maybe. you know, it's neck and neck, whatever. Right, so yeah, it was uh, whatever, I think, I don't know what year this came out, 89 or something? So I was a little kid. Something, 89, 90, anyway. Uh, whatever year this came out, I'm sitting there. My, you know, my mom comes out with a present for Hanukkah, right? You know, and it's a Macy's clothing box. And I open it up, and there's a bunch of tissue paper, presumably yeah. with like some shirts under it. No, there's a Mario 3 under there. <laughs> right? 
But Mario 3 is like it's the it's one of the earliest really really tight platformers. There's a reason why people look to this game when they're trying to create modern like Kaizo uh, platformers. They're trying to look at this control scheme because it allowed a lot with a very limited set of resources within the game. It's an NES game, but it pushed the limits of the NES, and it holds up today. It's still super fun. I'll just play it like casually. Uh-oh. Right, we're not, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. We're not, we're not playing any, all right, we, no Woo game, right? We're not here to, to play the Woo game. A lot of people will try to get free I badges. I didn't make Chrono Trigger, there's no reason to cheer. I made Chrono Trigger. You did? It's my made this game. Really? Yeah. Akira Toriyama, everybody. <laughs> But a lot of, let's say, mediocre panelists at conventions, they won't actually tell you anything interesting. They'll just have a cavalcade We're not of things. telling anything interesting. Well, we said at least one interesting thing. <laughs> they will just show you things you like, and you'll cheer for those things, and then they'll feel like you're cheering for them. Do not let panelists get away with this. Chrono Trigger is the height and end of a genre, in my opinion. No, no one ever made a game better at this than this. And no one ever will for a lot of reasons we don't have time to go into. Yeah. It's not the Chrono Trigger panel. For me, the most exciting thing about Chrono Trigger is that there's no random encounters. You can just like, run past the bad guys because I really hate random encounters. <laughs> I just want to turn them all off. Yep. And I think for me, it's just that this was one of the first RPGs that had the kind of story that would really draw people in. And it really used the fact that you're playing this kind of grindy long game to get you really attached to these characters as opposed to the sequel that added 10,000 additional characters that I didn't care about. Yeah, really, it's all, the thing that makes you realize this isn't just another JRPG is once you get to that court, courtroom, <laughs> right? If you, don't, if you never played it, then you don't know what I'm talking about, but you will play it because I'm telling you you should. But it's like you just play the game and you, get to the, you don't know anything and you get to the, you get your, suddenly you're on trial and what the judge says, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe they did this on the Super Nintendo. They're geniuses. <laughs> but basically, if you never played one of these kind of old RPG-type games on an old console, this is the one to play. Even over Final Fantasy VI, this one will get you the most feelings and the most fun for the least hours wasted. <laughs> I couldn't find a more iconic picture than this. <laughs> Counter-Strike is the reason Steam exists. Yeah, so people don't. So we were playing Counter Strike in 1999, 2000, when it was brand new, when it was just a free Half Life 1 mod. And in those days, if you wanted to get Counter Strike, you had to go to counter strike.net and download this mod and attach it to your Half Life 1. But the problem was is that everyone would be doing that when a new version came out, and you'd have to go through all these files, sites. Like, I'd wake up one morning, and Scott's on his computer, and I'm like, Scott, what's up? He's like, Crisis, there's a new Counter Strike, we gotta download it now. Otherwise, you couldn't connect to any server because all the servers upgraded overnight, right? Uh, so that's why Steam exists. You can auto-update. Do not take this auto-update feature for granted. It's like a miracle that I like. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about Counter-Strike, it's not that it started the genre. Action Quake 2 started this genre, and Counter-Strike came along later. In Action Quake 2, you die and don't come back? Oh, uh, yeah, depending on the mode you're playing. Right. But Counter-Strike persists to this day for a reason. It keeps getting re-released and updated periodically. It still is a serious competitive scene. It still is a good casual scene. It's a really fun game. And while there's a lot of other games like this, like PUBG and Arme and all these different games that well, are... Well, they're FPSs, but they're not like this. Realistic FPSs. Yeah, Counter-Strike is not realistic. Realistic. <laughs> Counter-Strike fills this nice niche of having a good balance of realism in that guns are dangerous, it only takes a couple of shots to kill you, maybe only one shot. It and... only seems to take one shot to kill me and a whole lot of shots to kill other people. What's up with that? <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> but it strikes that balance in a pretty unique way, and no other game is edged into Counter-Strike's space. They've always carved out an adjacent space. Yeah, there were, at the time of Counter-Strike, right, it's like, people now, it's like they saw PUBG, and then they saw Fortnite sort of copy PUBG, and then sort of this, and then everyone else is trying to get out on that same Battle Royale mode thing. The same thing happened with Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike was like the first big game to have the, we play, you die, and don't come back until the next round. There were tons and tons of games copying that die and don't come back until the next round thing, and Counter-Strike outlived them all. <laughs> or 20 years Counter-Strike anniversary going to be, right? 20 years, Counter-Strike.com. That's Counter-Strike.net. So, I thought we weren't doing any new games. So, I, I think it is, at, we're already at this point where we can agree that Zelda Breath of the Wild is the best and most complete Zelda game ever released. I don't think there's any way to disagree with that. I'll play Zelda 1. And the reason I say that is that Zelda 1 is a really important, fun game, but 
Breath of the Wild does what it does the things that Zelda 1 wanted to do. The technology just didn't exist yet. This game is about exploring this giant world. It basically changed the open world genre forever. You go into most open world games that came out before this and they feel empty. They feel barren. They feel like nothing. This game, there's something everywhere. Korok seeds usually. This is Scott's favorite game. This is, this is like the best game there is, right? It's like people don't appreciate when they watch like all these speed runs online. It's like Super Metroid is always like the highlight at the end, right? It's like why is Super Metroid the highlight at the end? What game has like such perfect platforming control, right? We see the same Metroidvania tropes of like, okay, get an item, go to now you have access to new areas. We call the genre Metroidvania. It's fifty percent of the genre right here. Right. Well, I think it's most. It's called Metroidvania. I don't. Not that Symphony of the Night isn't incredible, but <laughs> it's mostly because you had some people at the time who were playing Super Metroid, and some people a few years later who were introduced by Symphony of the Night, which is maybe second best to Super Metroid. Right. And that's why. But it's like if everyone had done Super Nintendos, we would just be calling it Metroid likes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But yeah, you know, there's tons and tons of Metroidvania games coming out these days. People are, you know, it was a genre that had like, was like a huge genre in those days and then was abandoned completely and then saw a resurgence maybe starting five to ten years ago. Yep, but there's a lot of old ones. You don't need to go play all of them. Play this one. There's really you're... only two good old ones. <laughs> the two I mentioned. So Sumer. You put Sumer on here? Sumer is unique and I think everyone should play it because most of them, has anyone here played a game called Mule? In all caps. Yeah, a handful of people. Why did you put Mule up here? Because Mule is kind of hard to get going. Mule Sumer, is not hard to get going. Sumer is sort of a modern Mule. Hey. Imagine a cross between a German board game and a real-time multiplayer video game. Right, so you've probably played some board games with like, that are worker placement games, right? And it's like you take turns, you're putting your workers out there, and usually it's like, okay, I choose the harvesting spot. Now no one else can choose the harvesting spot this turn, right? Sumer is the same kind of thing. You have this big sort of pyramid, and you have dudes, and you move them around, and you select rooms that are to place your workers in. But real-time worker real placement. It's real-time. You're, you're jumping and running and platforming to get your guys into the spots, and then once they're in the spots, then you play a board game. You get that frame-perfect jump? You're going to start talking about frame-perfect moves in a board game with yep. this. So it is, it is unique in that way. Also, uh, we beta tested this. Yep, it is super fun. Uh, it's out now, I think. You can just buy it's it. It's out. I've seen it at a lot of conventions. They got a little booth. Dig Dug! Oh, Dig Dug! I... Controversial opinion. Most old arcade games aren't actually fun enough to play in the modern era. Like, they're fun to poke at, but then you kind of get bored and peter out. Also, most of them are just, like, really, really frustrating to play, like, say, Asteroids. Yep. Or really, really pointless to play. Or they turn into Nim, where if you get good enough at them, it's not like, oh, I can play for 20 minutes and I die, and then I get better, now I play for an hour and I die. No. If you get better, you can play them forever. Your body stops you, not the game. Right, yeah. In those games, it's about you know, how long can you play, or, right, but in Dig Dug, it actually gets to a point where, like, you can't, a human can't really play perfectly well, at Dig there Dug. there are a few humans who can. I've seen some people who are good at I've this I've seen game. people who are about a thousand times as good as we are, but still, there's a point at which the dig gets dug. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dig Dug is the best old-school, simple, like, Atari-looking arcade game to play. If you want to, like, get good in an old game like that and see what it was like to play a game like that until the point you got good. The curve is easier on this one in terms of how you learn it than a lot of other old arcade games. Right, well, I mean, a lot of the old arcade games, it's like, it's just, you can, there's only one thing to do, like Space Invader. Shoot the guys, don't get hit. The game doesn't really go beyond that. It just gets faster and harder and there's more things to dodge and more things to shoot. Dig Dug, there is so much going on. When you start playing, it's like, all right, I just pump all the bad guys. I don't want to die. Then it's like, ooh, I learned I can drop rocks on bad guys. Ooh, I learned I get more points if I drop a rock on multiple bad guys at once. I can pump a bad guy to keep him in one spot and then drop a rock on him so he doesn't run away. A lot of emergent techniques and emergent gameplay from really simple mechanics. If I kill bad guys lower in the zone, I get more points. If I shoot a Fygar in the face, it's risky because he might breathe fire on me, but I also get more points. There's so much subtle, clever stuff going on in Dig Dug that you got to explore. And you can learn them on your own. This isn't inscrutable like most of those weird old games like Pack Rat. What the hell do you even do in pack rat you hit start you die and you don't know what happened <laughs>
Burning Wheel. A lot of people out there that play tabletop RPG, and 99% of them play D&D, and the other 1% play Pathfinder. I play D&D longer than I've done anything in my entire life. Right, but the point is, a lot of those people, since RPG, it's mostly because RPGs, tabletop ones, have such a huge investment in learning rules and reading and getting a group together, that you're not going to bother to play any of the other thousands of RPGs in the world. People don't even know they exist, because it's like they're not in bookstores or anything, right? They're only in the darkest corner of your local gaming shop if you have one, right? But Burning Wheel is perhaps the premier hardcore fantasy role-playing game that is nothing like D&D. If you want to play an RPG that d goes a different way, takes a different path, a game where if you hit someone with your sword, they're in the hospital for like six months. There's a hospital? <laughs> well, there's a hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game where if you want to get better at sword fighting, you've got to lose a sword fight. That's true. <laughs> this is a game... And live... <laughs> <laughs> yep, this is a game where you don't have money, you have a money stat. Money is a skill just like everything else. So, you want to buy a sword? Roll some dice. Yep, you could. You had the money to buy a sword. Or, nope, you didn't have the money to buy a sword. Also, it's a game where when you get into an argument with someone, in D&D you argue with someone, it's like, let's go left. No, let's go right. I want to go right. Yeah, okay, what do we do? But in Burning Wheel, there is our rules for arguing that are as complex and used more often than the complex rules for fighting. I hit you with my sword. I cast my spell. It's like, I hit you with the rebuttal. You hit, give me your rebuttal. Oh, but I got to roleplay it out now. If you don't roleplay it, you don't get to roll. There is a skill in this game called Ugly Truth. That's my favorite skill. It does exactly what you're imagining it does. <laughs> Try that. There are a lot of indie RPGs out there. There's a million different RPGs. We can't talk about a bunch of them. If you want to see a bunch of the stuff that happens in indie RPGs, like 80% of them are in this one you game. You can also just go to the internet and type in indie RPGs. Yep. Stop playing stupid D&D and Pathfinder. So, you got to move your body at least a little bit. And I wanted to recommend, like, ice hockey isn't really accessible to most of us. Too much money. Yeah. Skiing, Scott is just... He says Too dangerous. Don't ski. It's not that dangerous. Don't ski is dangerous. We, but... You Pro gotta play professional a Olympian skiing people like break their legs and die. So you should not be doing that. <laughs> uh, people, I broke two ribs at MAGFest four years ago. In a mosh pit. Yeah, that is true. That's good. <laughs> That's not skiing where you break your leg. That's just a rib. As an adult, or at least as someone who is in college or later, like many of you appear to be in this room, if you haven't played a competitive sport... Doesn't have to be tag. Yeah, play a competitive sport at least once or twice to remember what that feels like. But more importantly, we recently were at a party, and a bunch of kids were at this party playing tag. And a few of us, you know, 30-year-old weirdos were like, oh, tag, we can play tag. And it turned into a really hardcore, kind of difficult game of tag, and the kids got crushed, crushed out, and we played tag for like an hour. Tag is harder than you think. Tag is hard and way fun. You probably haven't played it in a while, so you probably don't remember, but... It's Seriously, hard. play some tag. Hear it. Okay. Uh -oh. Hanabi, unlike, say, Pandemic, is actually a co-op game. Right, there's a lot of co-op... You know, you're probably playing a lot of co-op games out there, and the thing that they're trying to hide from you is that all of those co-op games, most of them... Hear it. Okay, great. They're just solitaire, right? Imagine taking Microsoft Solitaire, and you got four friends sitting at the computer all deciding together what move to make. Right? And this is why that quarterbacking happens that everyone complains about. Why is one friend just telling everyone what to do? Because you don't need four people to figure out how, what move to make in solitaire. Everyone else can just chill, right? But Hanabi is a game that has an information economy, right? And everyone has their cards facing away from them. So you don't know what's in your hand, but you're responsible for playing the cards in your own hand. Playing the right cards at the right times. And so all of you, you're depending on all the other players, right? You literally cannot physically quarterback Hanabi without cheating, right? You must cooperate, and you will be limited to the weakest link in the chain. If any player is weak, you're going to fail at Hanabi. You need everyone to contribute to succeed at this game. It is true co-op. There aren't a lot of true co-op games. That's why this game deservedly won Game of the Year, and you should play it, and it's really tiny and fast. Yep, you basically either play a card out of your hand blind, or you spend a resource to tell someone else something about their hand. You have two blue cards, those two. It's real fun. And now I know the other two aren't blue, and I have to remember this because I can't look at my hand. WarioWare Inc. You can play this. There's a lot of WarioWare games. None of them did multiplayer right except this one. Yep, so this, this, 
A lot of people might like those, you know, the solo Wario wares and the GBA or the DS or whatever, and those are fine. Those, there's nothing wrong with those. But the game we are telling you to play is the GameCube WarioWare multiplayer, specifically. No other multiplayer WarioWare or single player WarioWare. The GameCube multiplayer one is the one to play. And inside of that game, specifically, Turtle Mode. Turtle mode is the best mode. Dance club mode is like number two, but turtle is the key. Turtle is high quality. Some of you have no idea what we're talking about. WarioWare in this instance was a multiplayer game that gave you all the feels and fun of playing Mario Party, but it takes like 10 minutes instead of an hour. And was somewhat skill-based, yep. not just luck. It is, in fact, mostly skill-based, and it can get pretty vicious. If you want to see uh, micro games done right for a group, no one's done better than this. Like, literally, no one has made this game better. The one that came out on the Wii was worse, objectively. A lot worse. Huh. So, trivia games tend not to be popular with this crowd. Well, trivia games tend to suck in general, right? It's like, I've got a co like two copies of Trivial Pursuit Genus 3, which is from my parents' generation, and it's all questions about famous people and events that you don't know, because I'm not 20 years older than I am, <laughs> right? And I, maybe some people in this room would be really good at it, but most people won't. And most trivia games have this problem where it's like you either know it or you don't. And if you don't know it, the game sucks. And if someone does know it, the game also sucks. So and this it, is a trivia game, but one of those names up there on that box is Friedman Fries, who also designed games you might have played like Power Grid. Right. So this is actually based on another game Friedman Fries made called what, Flora or Fauna? Fa fauna? Flora? It's one of the two. It's, it's either, an F. It's either animal trivia or plant trivia. I can't remember. But they took that same exact game and they remade it as America trivia. And I imagine most people here know things about America. Some international people maybe, but you know, America's evil and colonial, so people some elsewhere know about it too. But the uh, trivia game's rules work like a German board game. You're like putting cubes down and there's a game there. Right, so what comes out in this game will be like, all right, we're going to do M&M trivia now. M&M's an American thing, kind of, right? All right, tell me what year M&M's were invented. Tell me what state their most M&M's are eaten in. And How many M&M's are eaten per year? Right, in the U.S. And so there's three different trivia questions, and you guess on these tracks. Right? And you put your cubes out on the track on the year, state, or number that you're guessing for the three different trivia questions. And so what you take turns. So Rim puts his guess on like 1920-something. Yep. And I'm like, well, that's what I was thinking. I'll go on 1930-something. And if you're close, guess what? It's horseshoes. You still get some points. Right? So you can still get all this trivia fun and make educated guesses and lean on other people's information and also try to make way out guesses. You know, and it won't be completely pointless if you don't know anything about M&Ms or baseball or whatever comes up. Overwatch. Mm. If you want to play a competitive multiplayer FPS today, I want to tell you to play Weapons Factory. I want to tell you to play Tribes. To all uh, these games don't exist. Yeah, yeah. Overwatch exists today, and Overwatch uniquely... Many people don't realize it. It's not really based. It's kind of based on like the Team Fortress 2 style of game, Team Fortress, Team Fortress Classic. Mm -hmm. But it shares a lot more of its lineage with games like Weapons Factory and Action Quake 2. Mm -hmm. The hardcore old FPSs where you bind a million keys. You think we'd get the museum to play Action Quake 2 instead of Quake Ooh, 1? I'll yeah. try to make that happen. Try to make it happen. Yeah, Action Quake 2 would be really popular. Or Weapons here. Factory. Or Either one. Mega TF. Either any of those three I would yeah. play. Overwatch will let you experience 90% of what those old games were like without you having to deal with the pain of getting an old DOS game to work on the internet in 2019. <laughs> we had to put one and only one VR game on here. No, we don't have to. We because VR, VR is not mass market yet. It's still sort of niche market, and it's starting to expand into the expanded market a little bit. I'm going to be the VR poo-poo head. I say, until VR is, like, really tiny, as long as i got to wear a big freaking thing on my head, screw it. It's not worth it. I have a lot of fun with VR. If you haven't done VR at all yet, and you want to try it, and you want to play it, Super Hot VR is one of a handful of fully realized VR games. You can also play this game in not VR, and it is a really good game. It is. But this game in VR is transcendent. It's one of the few peak VR experiences that exist so far. So the way it works is this is an FPS, solo FPS, where all these kinds of dudes are coming to kill you, right? And the thing is, unlike other FPSs, which are super fast, and you're running around shooting and ninja-ing and this whatever. This one's super hot. Right, this one's super hot. Nothing moves. It's just everything is still. You see the bad guy right there with his sword, just like, hey, hey. But it, so if you're not moving, they're not moving. So you're Neo the whole time. So the guy's got a gun pointed in your face, and you're like. And 
They move at the rate you move. They only move when you move. So if you go, grab the gun and get him in the face. Right, if they go, uh, they go. You see a guy shoot the gun, and you just freeze, and you see the bullet coming at you, and you're like. And, but as you go, he's coming like. The bullet's like. It's really good. It kind of messes with your brain to play it in VR, and when you come out of VR, it's kind of a problem. Right. It's really about an economy of movement. It's like, I can move this much, I gotta kill as many guys as I can and not be killed with this much movement. I want a fighting game like this. Yeah, that'd be great. Alright, Battletech! So, there's tons of crusty old war games out there. We're not, no, we're not telling you to play the video game. No, no, we're telling pen and paper Battletech on a table, little, you know, with these pieces of paper, right? And the thing about Battletech, is compared to all those other crusty games, it seems complicated and just as hard, uh, but actually it's not. Most of this sheet is just armor bubbles that you fill in, which is really, if you like filling in Scantron sheets, like me, <laughs> that'll take us the game for you. It's like, oh, 10 damage on the left. Whee! <laughs> I've never been so happy to get hit with a missile. <laughs> Whee! Filling in the dots. All right. The other thing about Battletech is that when you play it, most of the rules are roll 2d6, look up on a table, read what happens. Oh, and it all makes like common sense. Like, oh, I got shot in the left torso. The armor is gone. It hit my internal torso. That's where my missile rack is. It hit the missile rack. Roll some dice. The missiles blew up. Now my arm fell off. <laughs> all right, my friend wants to pick up the arm and bludgeon me with it. He does. You can just do anything that makes sense for a giant, slow robot to do, and it happens, and it's simulatory. Yep. And the simulatory aspect makes it super fun. I shot you in the face. I eject. <laughs> right? It lets crazy stuff happen, emergent narrative gameplay happen, weird crap happens, and it lets you experience weird, old, complicated war game without actually playing, like, the Battle of the Marne, Eight Hours of Hell. And if you get your friends way into it, you can do custom stuff, which is actually part of the legit rules. I want a mech that just walks on all fours. We got rules for that. Can I make I a mech that's just two railguns, no arms, no legs? Yes, you can do this. <laughs> I don't want to use mechs. I want to just send a million helicopters. Okay. <laughs> we got submarines, we got boats, we got tanks, we got little dudes with armor. And you can technically, it's an RPG, you can play it like you'd play d and I just want to shoot the planet from my spaceship. Okay, do that too. There's a book for that. So, Civ games are real important. These four did you put games. a picture of Civ 2 and then write Civ 5, 6 in the top? Yes, I did. <laughs> I think I've played more hours of Civ 2 than any game I've ever played. Maybe. I played a lot of Civ Because I was in high school. What else was I going to do? But really, right now, Civilization games are very good. There's a long history in them. Civ 5 was the first one that was streamlined. And Civ 5 is really worth playing to see what Civ is like. Yeah, Civ 3 and 4 were sort of like this dip. Like, yeah. Yep. Civ 2 is not worth playing in the modern era. Like, don't bother with you it. Can play, if you can get it to run, you might as well just go check to see what it looks like, but you don't need to invest hours into it. Play Civilization 5 to see what happens if you turn a Civ game into a serious, competitive, almost board game. Play Civ 6 if you want to see what happens when Genghis Khan gets nukes, and it's hilarious. <laughs> Quartermaster General is Axis and Allies, if Axis and Allies were good and designed by someone who knew what they were doing. And only took like an hour. Quartermaster General is way fun. It's simplified and abstracted, and it's more like the real experience of managing logistics in a war. You're not saying, like, I attack Ukraine with 18 units and let's roll a bunch of dice. I'll say things like, I attack Ukraine, it just succeeds. One unit goes there. Right. It's very simple. And All very you elegant. do on your turn is play a card. One That's card. pretty much it. It's like it's a card game. It's like you go around, and the other thing is three on three, right? You have three ally players and three Axis players, and you take turns going back and forth. Right? Well, and it's like a specific order. It's like, what, U.S. is yep, last, yep. right? Whatever, anyway. But all you do in your turn is play a card. It's super simple. It's like, Navy battle. I remove a Navy from the board. Your turn. Right? Really straightforward, not complicated, no big setup, and takes way short amount of time, but is just as fun, if not more fun, than, say, Axis and Allies, which takes forever and has a million pieces. Also, fun fact, Scott is banned for life from ever playing so this game again. So I was again. complaining because, like I said, it's a card game, and I got bullshit draws, like, every time I played and couldn't do anything. Like, well, I got no battle cards, guess I lose. Well, World War II went very differently this time, and that was funny. Let's play again. Right. Uh, he so, was so salty. This went on all so night. So I said, hey, we should change the game to where we, like, draft the cards, and we don't have this problem. And they were like, no, 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 can't do that. Meanwhile, an expansion just came out. The expansion implements the two rule changes I specifically suggested, exactly as I suggested them. It's a shame you got yourself banned before that came out. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Hearthstone! Woo! 
So there's tons of card games out there these days, right? You got your Artifact just came out, which doesn't seem to be doing too well. Magic is on the rise and has its new Arena version, right? It's, and did just card games, Keyforge just came out. Yep. Right? We got more card games you know what to do with. You can just live card games your whole life, right? The reason I say play Hearthstone is two reasons. Well, a few reasons. Number one is free, right? You don't have to pay nothing. Free. Actually free. It only costs money if you want to win. <laughs> okay? You don't got, if you don't want to win, you don't have any Hearthstone cards. You can just play Hearthstone with your friends, right? Have a good time. It's way fun. Number two, Hearthstone, unlike every other card game that's digital, has a user interface that doesn't suck. That's pretty much the main reason I still play it, right? It's like, I can get this on my iPad. What other game can you get on your iPad as good as Hearthstone as multiplayer? Nothing, right? Civilization VI. Maybe. <laughs> and number three, Civilization uh, Hearthstone. <laughs> Hearthstone knows it's a digital card game, right? And this makes it truly unique. There are cards in Hearthstone that do things, a lot of them in fact, that are absolutely impossible to do if you were playing a card game with cardboard, right? Create a random dude just from anywhere in the whole game of Hearthstone. It's like, what are you going to do? Imagine if Magic had a card, replace this with any artifact made before 1998. It's like you'd have to have a card for every artifact that came before 98 and shuffle it and draw one and put it on the table, right? Hearthstone does ridiculous things. They came up with a card, destroy half your opponent's deck. It's not a very good card, but it's hella awesome, <laughs> right? It's incredible, right? It's super fun, you, and it, even if you don't play Hearthstone, you can watch it on Twitch, which I do a lot also, because that's just super fun. Inheritance. Gotta have at least one LARP on here. Mm -hmm. Have any of you ever LARPed? I'm curious. Live action roleplay. Right. Only hands up now for non vampire LARPs. Oh. <laughs> All right. Non actually hitting people with foam swords LARPs. Oh, well, the numbers dwindle. There's still a few. So LARPing gets a bad rap. Because of vampires and people hitting people with foam swords. Yep. Sometimes at the same time. But there's another way to LARP. Some people just play D&D, &D, but they kind of just LARP it, and that's fine. But there are games that are designed to be LARPs, meaning they have mechanics to facilitate role-playing and acting, and they are lightweight because you can't act out a big scene and then like sit down and roll a bunch of dice to see what happens. That's not the point of a LARP. You live in the moment. You live the character. Right. It's more like improv theater. There's the Scandinavian LARP tradition, which is called that because it comes from the Scandinavian LARP cultures, right? And it has been more recent in recent years has been exported to the rest of the gaming world, while, but, you know, only a few people know about it, the cool people. You can be the cool people. You these, can do it. These are often very serious games, like people cry, people break down, you get a little physical. This is like really, really hardcore role-playing. One of the games we've seen is just called Thanksgiving. You role-play three successive Thanksgiving dinners with a family, and you sit down, you eat the real meal, you eat a meal. And after the first night, like you've all role played, like you got your characters, everyone learns something new about the family. And then you role play the next Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, people are seeing where this is going. It goes dark. <laughs> Inheritance is a relatively recently released game by the same person who did Burning Wheel that you can just buy. You can buy this game, and you can will be. You? Yeah, you can just buy it. Some more copies. Yeah. Okay. This is a is a LARP that has all the rules, all the materials, everything you need to play one of those Scandinavian style LARPs. It's amazing. I've seen people cry, ugly cry, playing this game. Basically, there's a Viking funeral going down, and you're one of the people at the funeral, ranging from yep. like the wife of the deceased to the rune master to the princes to the to the uh, to the prodigal son who murdered the other son, and fled into exile, who has returned. And you're fighting over the inheritance. At the end of the game, you read the will. It's good stuff. The will is really good. Yeah. The, the game comes with the will. At some point, someone busts the will out and starts the, the reading root, it. The lore master guy has it, right? Yeah. And then at some point, he opens it. Captain Sonar. Not that many real-time board games, as many of you went to other panel we're talking also, about. Also, you know... Even though we've already mentioned a team game, Quartermaster General, those are like the only two team games. It's like we mentioned all the team games because team games are great and there's not enough of them. Captain Sonar is like the only real-time team tabletop game I know about. So you ever seen Hunt for Red October? You have two teams of eight. Each team is four people. You're sitting at a table on the opposite of the other people. You're in a submarine. You just in real time go like, Captain, move north, move north, move east, move west. And everyone's like writing stuff down and doing things based on the orders the captain's giving. One of the person's jobs is to listen to what the other team's saying and try to figure out where they are so your captain can go fuck them up. 
But meanwhile, your captain is moving, and they got someone listening, and so forth. It's live. It's real time. So literally, the game, like, we'll just be sitting there silent. And then Scott, the captain, is like, move north. Move east. And suddenly someone on the other side is like, Captain, I think I know where they are. And then suddenly Scott's like, oh shit, move west, move west, move west, move west. Use this, use the stealth, use the stealth. Use our special ability. This fire, game fire is, torpedo. This game is ridiculously fun. Find an excuse to play it. You can also put mines around the board. Yeah. Jungle speed. Is a sport. It's a tabletop sport. So when I was Googling to get a picture of this game to put in these slides, I found a really interesting <laughs> image. <laughs> Fun fact, it's even funnier, Jason Morningstar, the person who posted this, is the designer of the game Fiasco. Right, he's a prominent indie RPG personality. Jason Morningstar broke someone else's finger in 2006 playing Jungle Speed. Jungle Speed is a real-time sport. You flip cards over, you do a thing, and eventually there's a duel. And among two players, or maybe more than two, someone has to be holding that piece of wood. Yeah, the modern jungle speeds you're going to buy come with a rubber thing. Yeah, it's, it's a lot safer, to be fair. You want the wood one. You want to break some fingers? Let's go. <laughs> this is a tabletop sport. Try a tabletop sport. Don't break too many fingers. If you want to have a lot of fun, you can play jungle speed and put that totem in a really fun place, like another room, the roof, the swimming pool, <laughs> the ocean, the toilet. <laughs> At a, at a MAGFest, before it was in the Gaylord, we had a jungle speed game where the totem ended up getting knocked into the air, flew over the balcony, and landed on someone else's game. <laughs> Camel up! All right, so who likes gambling? Yeah. Gambling's bad, don't Gambling for fake money. Woo! All right, so if you want to sit around, right, and there's a little camel race going on, you got to bet on those camels. Come on, green. <laughs> right? That's what this game is all about, only it's super family fun, even though you're gambling. People who know us or you see the kind of games we're talking about, you assume we like super serious, like brains banging against brains. The smartest person wins. This game is random. Hours. Random wins. This game is some random BS because it's just as fun as a super serious game. And also... It's not Camel Cup, as many people erroneously believe. It's Camel Up, because the camels stack up. The orange camel, if it moves before the yellow one or the green one, might just carry them to victory. <laughs> so, we're older, so I'm going to say Fortnite, but you could play, uh, uh, you'd play PUBG if you're even older. You got to see what the deal is with these games. The, remember what, we talked about how important Counter-Strike was, how Counter-Strike like, made Steam exist? Fortnite is that all over again. Yeah. Fortnite is the game. Literally everyone else is playing it. You gotta at least see what the deal is with these Battle Royale games. At least games. it doesn't cost you any money. Yep. Maybe you play PUBG instead. Maybe you play, well, don't play the Counter-Strike Battle Royale because it's kind of garbage. But play one of these games. You gotta know what the deal is. Also, side note, everyone is always calling these like Battle Royale mode. You should go see the movie or read the book, Battle Royale. Yes. If you can stomach it. Would do you, not, however, read the manga Battle Royale. Do not see Battle Royale 2. That's awful. <laughs> so. <laughs> Why does this keep working? Is it really funny? I guess it's that funny. Anyway, like we talked about those other free games, like the Hearthstone and the Fortnite, this game is not free. But you can... I'm not saying to go become a magic player, right, and spend money and do drafts or whatever it is. I'm saying at least go get one of those free learning magic decks, right, and play it against your friend, like green versus red or something like that. You need to at least know the rules of Magic the Gathering. So I played Magic in the earliest days, Beta Unlimited Revised. They, because the anniversary of Magic came up recently, they had a timeline on their website that showed which year each set came out. I played Magic from the year 1993 to 1994. When Fallen Empires came out, I thought it was a BS expansion. I felt like the game was in decline. I really didn't like Ice Age, and I quit when Alliances came out. <laughs> so, despite having played it then and then not played it for decades, I can sit down and play it today. The rules are familiar. The rules work. There's so few things I don't know about modern magic. It is amazing that a game that has evolved so much, lasted so long, has so much love and so many players... <laughs> I could just sit down and play it today with the rules I learned in middle school. Right, and because I played Magic in 1993 and 1994, in 2014, I was able to install Hearthstone and play it with no instructions whatsoever. 
right? There's so many games today where I open them up and play them, and thanks to my magic knowledge from my middle school days, I am now able to play all these other games because magic basically invented half of the things that every card game does forever, and none of those things existed before magic. Yeah, do you know what we did before tapping? It was not pretty. I was like tapping. In 1993. I didn't know that meant turn a card sideways. There's a reason why every game uses a different noun or verb to describe these things. Well, they things. don't want to get sued. Yeah, but it's summoning sickness. We all know what summoning sickness is. I can tell someone, oh yeah, this game has summoning sickness. There's a lot of, there's a lot of walk sideways and hit things games. Yep, they're kind of cathartic. They're fun. They're usually not that skill-based. And this one, you should play this one because it has the best music. Yeah. It's really, I mean, they're all the side, walk sideways and hit things games are pretty much the same. River City Ransom's a little different. Yep. Has a little RPG action. It's cute. You know, this Final one, Fight, just as good. But this, this why, one not more, play, why not play the one with the bumping music? I would say this one has a tiny bit more skill input than Final Fight. Barely. Just a little. A little bit. But it doesn't matter. I will they, often go to YouTube and just type Streets of Rage OST play. I mean, it's just like the X-Men game or the Simpsons game. These are games where you're just going to play through the whole thing because it's kind of fun. It's an experience, kind of like Castle Crashers. This is what, how to see what those games were like in the old days, and it's still pretty fun. So roguelikes are a thing. Roguelikes are like increasingly, like roguelike is a genre that's continuing to bust out. And you could and try to play Rogue, the game that roguelikes are named after, yep. but that really kind of sucks, actually. You can try to play NetHack, which doesn't suck, but good luck. You yep. can try to play Dwarf Fortress, you'll need even more luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> you won't have fun, you'll have fun. Right, but thanks to more modern game design techniques, we have applied the roguelike you know, scheme of play until you die through a procedurally generated world that's different every time to other genres besides ASCII text in a dungeon. And the best of those so far is maybe FTL. Yep. Uh, it's just, it's a real-time game. You play the game, you make your actions, you evolve your it's shit. It's not real-time. Yeah, well, it's real-time until you pause it. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> but it's emergent gameplay. It doesn't have to be balanced. The cool thing about roguelikes is that emergent weird things happen. You might get a really OP ship one time. Sure, you just get to experience that. Maybe one time you just get creamed. Sure, that's fine. Oh, great, fun. a bunch of rock guys attack me immediately. Yep. <laughs> great. But you'll have, you'll have these experiences of winning big, losing big. The roguelikes, because of the emergent gameplay and the procedurally generated content, will give you a wide range of experiences that are not constrained by the type of balance things you have to do in multiplayer games. The game does not have to be balanced. It only has to be fun. I guess we will tell you to play StarCraft. <laughs> right, because so there's a lot of RTSs out there. I suck at all of them because I can't click faster than like a few times a second. The thing is, you also suck at turn-based strategy games. No, I suck way more at real-time strategy yeah. games. I too suck at real-time strategy games. Right, but I mean, I guess you should play one of them, and StarCraft is the one, so play it. Yep. So, there's train games, meaning they have a train theme. But then there's train games. You know a train game, because it looks like some of this nonsense. Or it involves crayons. Yep, it involves crayons, it involves stock certificates, it involves having a company that has money, and a player who has their own separate money, and maybe one player has two companies. So I just played 1889 two days ago, one day? Uh, I don't remember. But uh, I played it at MAGFest, and basically, the operating round, which is the part where you actually run the trains and get money and put out the hexes on the map, that took like five minutes, and then we spent like 30 minutes in the stock round, <laughs> buying and selling stocks between each other, going round and round and round and round and round and round. It's like, okay, can we operate now? Okay, operate, operate, Sorry. operate. Here's stock the, round. Here's the deal. A lot of scary people like train games, kind of like war games. Or a lot of people have never encountered a train game before, or they've seen the scary people playing the scary looking game and just avoided it. Right, they think, oh, that's the kind of game scary people play. I will not go near it. I advise all of you to try 1846 to find out what those train games are like. Because yeah. I... This is the entry one. There's a whole series, 18 whatever. It's like people call it 18XX, 1846, yep. 1889, 18XDX, whatever. <laughs> right? There's tons of them, but this is the entry one. Right? The first one you should play, the most accessible, the easiest to learn. You know, uh, they're all crooked slightly different, right? Like this one, you can see the stock market at the top is a straight line. The one I played yesterday, the stock market was like this big diagonal thing, right? But much like Dance Dance Revolution, which we thought looked stupid, and then we got addicted to it, I always avoided these games. And then I played 1846, and I discovered something very dark about myself. 
The best thing I can say about these games is that I'm very not upset when I lose. Because I pretty much assume I'm going to lose from the get-go. And I just have a whole bunch of fun making companies and running trains. I went bankrupt and came in last place this weekend. And I'm just like, <laughs> whatever. That was good. So, a, a turn-based strategy game. It is hard to overstate how well designed the Advance Wars games are. A lot of people think it's easy to clone an Advance Wars game. Right, and we've been like, oh, Nintendo won't make any Advance Wars. Why doesn't someone clone this? Well, a lot of people have. There's one on iOS, it's called like Warbits. Yep, it's right? okay. They got Tiny Metal, yep. they got some other one out there. Into the there. Breach is adjacent, like it's Kinda. in that space. There's like that fantasy looking one. Yep. They all suck compared to Advance Wars. They can't do it. It's really hard. Now, Advance Wars, you know, turn-based, simple game. You're moving military units around, you know, like you, the artillery attacks the tank or whatever. Every Advance Wars game is different. The, the, they're pretty much all worth playing, at least all the ones from Game Boy Advance onward. But the reason why I say these are worth playing over all other games like it, the reason they're so good is that they took a ton of time, a ton of headcount, a ton of money to make. They are such curated experiences that there is no economy in making another game like this ever. You will never recoup your money. There's no way. So play all the Advance Wars games, and then weep that we'll, there will never be another game like this. There might be one. Not anytime soon. There's no reason to spend that much time to make a game this small and this simple looking. A lot of Mario Karts out there. There are a lot of Mario Karts out there, and I've played this one more than the others, and I can, with objective measure, tell you this is the best Mario Kart game there ever was. This is the third Mario Kart game. There was SNES, then N64, then GBA. This includes the circuits from the SNES one, plus some new circuits. And why is this Mario Kart better than all the Mario Karts that came after? It has less characters, it has less total tracks, you know, it's not super 3D. Not why, selling me on this so far. Why is this one so great? And the reason this one is so great is because this is the only skill-based Mario Kart that has ever existed. Most Mario Karts, the winning and losing is, oh, you got some item, you got the blue shell, right? In or this, you Fox only Final Destination it. Right, and there are some ways you can dodge the blue shell sometimes. In this game, if you drive perfectly, if you drift around every corner, if you never slow down, if you never go off-road, if you never tap the brake, if you drive absolutely perfectly on every track with your perfect driving skills, red shells, blue shells, any attack whatsoever will hover behind your ass and not touch you. And if you keep driving perfectly, even the blue shell will go, ah, fuck it, and give up. <laughs> and I was good enough at this game that the blue shell always fucking gave up, <laughs> right? So if you care about racing and don't want to just lose to your friends because they got lucky with the blue shell, you should play this Mario Kart and not the other Mario Karts. If you just want with Mario Kart, they're all the same, pick whatever. Yeah. Zendo. Zendo. Zendo just got reprinted, so you can just buy it. This game is pretty simple. The problem is we played Zendo before you could just buy it by buying a lot of these Ice House pieces from Looney Labs. You could play Zendo really with any collection of lots of similar pieces, right? You just need lots and lots of the same pieces over and over again, but enough different pieces, whatever. Yeah, basically this game is interesting because it's a game where it's sort of cooperative, but not really. It can take an unlimited number of players. Any player can join or quit at any time. One person is Except the, the master. One person is the master. They're facilitating the game. They've made up a rule, like a Cohen, a shape. One of these collections has the Buddha nature if it has exactly one red pyramid. If it has, if the largest pyramid is black. If the smallest pyramid is pointing at the largest pyramid. Right. So through the process of elimination, the students are creating collections out of pieces and saying, Master, is this exhibit the Buddha nature or not? And through the process of elimination of making more and more examples and figuring out, okay, well, this one's good and that one's bad, they're trying to figure out what the rule is. Why is this one good and that one bad? And the cool thing is it doesn't require, like when you have a hidden piece of information like that, it's very easy for people to mess it up. The way this game works, it doesn't matter what the rule is that the master thought in their head. The master loses when the student makes up their own rule that is functionally equivalent. The master can only refute the student's rule by proving them wrong on the board. Right, so if you come up with a rule, it might not be the same as my rule, but if I can't create something that doesn't exhibit the Buddha nature that matches your rule or does exhibit 
the food of nature that does match your rule. If I can't create a counterexample physically, then you're right because your rule is the same as my rule mathematically. The game is also a great attractor to meet people at conventions because you set up all these pieces all over the table. People walk over and they see all this and they're curious what the hell you're That's playing. That's a very small zendo. Usually it's like, whoa, because they've made so many examples and they can't figure out the rule yet. But when someone comes over and says, hey, what's this game? You can say, would you like to play? You hand him a guessing stone and you're like, you're in. They're in. They're in. Five Nights at Freddy's. Just the first one. Just the first one. There's a lot of scary games out there and they all do different scary things. Five Nights at Freddy's is interesting because it uses scares in the most effective way I've ever seen. Five Nights at Freddy's gives an adult who is not normally scared of things at haunted houses the brief experience of being a kid in a haunted house. Because it uses jump scares not as the beats that drive the game, but as the punishment for failing at the game at the end. The game is just a trick to get you to lean in, look at that screen really closely, have your attention focused so the jump scare gets you. It is so well designed. There's right. a it's like, oh, you don't want to put your head in a position where you will be jump scared? Lose then. Right? So, all right, I'll come and make sure I got this right. Ah! It does. Like, I have a whole video essay that's on YouTube of going into the details. Don't watch it until you play the game because it's spoilers. But it does things like you think the game crash. Like, you're going to die, and then nothing happens. And you're just like, wait, what? Wait? What's going on? And eventually, you go to move the mouse a little bit. It knows that, and it jump scares you right then. <laughs> Street Fighter 2. There's a lot of fighting games in the world. Street Fighter is still, at least Street Fighter 2 at least, is the first one to have a whole bunch of different asymmetric characters, right? You could try to play Street Fighter 1. It's really bad. It's not that fun. It's not, it's not good. There's a reason you don't even see it in the MAGFest arcade. No one wants to play that, right? Street Fighter 2, literally, the first ever fighting game where you choose your character and they're all different and they all have special moves. It doesn't matter which Street Fighter 2 you're going to play. You can get the super one, the champion one. And, and as long as you're not a good pro, enough. as long as you're not like super pro at it, it's just as fun as any modern fighting game. Yeah, it doesn't really make a difference unless you're a super pro person. You know, What's the difference between Street Fighter 2 and Street Fighter 3? If you're not super great at fighting games, you don't notice any difference. As soon as you notice the difference, you're one of those people. Right. <laughs> Head to, to Evo with you. <laughs> Move, buffer, what now? Cancel something? Fandante is poker but fun. It makes every single poker hand, that ha like the fancy hand where everyone is bluffing, everyone has a royal flush, it's a giant crazy scene. It's also super fun because you can go floosh because there's a floosh in addition to a flush. Yep, it's panda themed, it's cute, it's fun poker, and this game in the book has legit real money gambling rules if you want to play for real money. Don't do that. Magical Drop. You've probably played some Tetris. You've probably played some whatever, right? Magical Drop is the biz. It used to be at MAGFest. I don't know why they didn't bring it, those assholes, but you can get it on Switch. <laughs> you can get the original arcade Neo Geo one on Switch. Get this game. It is like one of the best puzzly games. Why did you put one with well, the world not... on the left? You could have gotten justice in that screenshot. <laughs> so not because it's a puzzly game. There's a lot of puzzly games. Because it is a competitive puzzly game. Direct versus puzzle game. That's a whole genre. This one's the best one to play to see if you like that genre. The advanced one is Battle Balls, but they can't play it easily. You can't play Battle Balls easily. Battle Balls, I think, is better than Magical Drop. That's Maybe. my controversial take. Old-timey games? Not that fun, usually. There's a reason to at least play one of them. If you've never played chess or checkers or backgammon or any one of those like old games that evolved over hundreds of years, backgammon is the one to try. Backgammon is great. Also, maybe dominoes. For the one reason is that if you travel the world, you will actually you won't run into people playing you know these games on the street except backgammon. If you go around the world, especially to like Middle East, Eastern Europe, you will see backgammon on the street with old guys. And if you know how to play backgammon, you can make friends with old guys, and that is very useful. Yep. <laughs> Last and least, Atari games are better than people will tell you they are. And the ATT game in particular is way better than you might think. But Atari games aren't actually usually that worth playing. Maybe 1 or 2% of them are worth playing at all in the modern era. Outlaw is the one to play. Outlaw, you can still play with your friends and have a great time. Especially, com like, combat is garbage compared to Outlaw. 
right? All this game is is two cowboys. You control one. Your friend controls the other one. You can walk up and down. You can walk left and right. And you can shoot. And you can shoot straight up or down, and they bounce off the walls. That's the whole game. Shoot, yep. shoot the other cowboy. There's a panel we did at PAX years ago called Atari Game Design. We also did it at MAGFest once where we talk about Outlaw in depth, and then we play it on stage. The game is so fun that we kind of just get lost in playing it on stage for a while, and the audience is like, ah, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> I hope this was enjoyable. We're out of time. I hope I can go home now. I don't know why you people came here on Sunday at MAGFest, but I guess... Enjoy I the rest of your comedy. It looks good for me. If you don't think you can Google Geek Nights to find videos of all our talks, grab one of these flyers. And also, fun fact, these flyers are vintage. These were printed for us in 2006. So the whole back is like, what's a podcast? How do I download podcasts? <laughs> All right, go home. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we will at some point after the con. And we have another one we did at PAX called the 40 uh, Tabletop Games we must play. It's just at, it's on YouTube right now. Uh, yeah, that'll take you to our website. You'll find our YouTube channel from there. It's all pretty straightforward. Nick, watch the Negro account. Oh, awesome. Second question.